Paris has lived up to its nickname, the City of Light, by ushering in its fifth annual Nuit Blanche, an all-night cultural extravaganza. Thousands of people flock to the Place de la Concorde to admire the fountains bathed in blue light, with the obelisk and a very glittering Eiffel Tower in the background. The Nuit Blanche, which translates as White Night, is billed as an evening of cultural discovery. Everything stays open, from museums and libraries, to monuments, places of worship, tourist sites, cinemas, parks, gardens, hospitals, even swimming pools. Some 1,000 artists also participated in the event, displaying their artistic and cultural works until dawn. The event was dreamed up by Paris's flamboyant mayor Bertrand Delano and his aides, as part of a wider plan to liven Paris up with entertaining festivals and playful initiatives. It joins Paris Plage, which transforms a section of the Seine riverbank into a sort of man-made beach for summer, complete with deck chairs and palm trees. It's hoped the two projects will also help squeeze cars off inner city roads by enlarging bus and bicycle lanes. As the sun comes up, each district's city hall, local associations and shopkeepers organise breakfast for those stairs who've lasted all through the night. Throughout the city, streets were clogged with some 1.5 million people going from one venue to another. The crowd also included many cyclists, who took the opportunity to tour Paris by night. But perhaps next year, organisers could really sort out their colour scheme. The blue of the fountains is different from the blue of the obelisk, so we're perturbed. Au revoir et bon nuit. Coming up, a luxury cruise through time. Everybody knows the tragic story of the Titanic. The ultimate luxury cruise liner which set sail in April 1912 from Southampton never to arrive at its destination, New York. A massive collision with an iceberg left the supposedly unsinkable ship floundering in the icy seas, killing 1,490 passengers. It carried some of the richest, most powerful industrialists of her day. Together, their personal fortunes were worth around 600 million US dollars, quite a tidy sum by 1912 standards. A recent French exhibition brought together hundreds of objects recovered from the wreck of the Titanic. The Titanic is a myth. The Titanic was a myth before its maiden voyage. There was the journey, then the catastrophe, and this superb, you could say sublime tragedy. And so afterwards, the myth has carried on. The artifacts in the exhibition were recovered by more than six expeditions between 1987 and 2000 to the wreck of the Titanic. In excess of 6,000 objects were recovered all of which underwent a thorough process of conservation to ensure that they won't be harmed by air after lying on the bed of the ocean for such a long time. All the objects are treasures. The simple fact that they were part of a boat that was a legend, a myth, these are treasures, and I think that every visitor will more or less find their favourite. A cap, a pair of glasses, a sheet of music, a magnificent, beautiful piece of remains, like the porthole that was found in the first expedition. Everyone will find their thing, I think. Despite knowing the whereabouts of the Titanic ever since it went down in 1912, its location two and a half miles under the sea and 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland made it impossible to reach until 1985. It wasn't until then that scientists and researchers were able to confirm what really happened on that fateful night. Debris falling out of the ship was strewn over half a mile across the sea floor, and the Titanic itself had snapped in two. In addition to the wealthy and middle-class passengers, she carried poor emigrants from Europe and the Middle East, 
seeking economic and social freedom in the new world. It was a boat which had to evoke luxury, even for third-class passengers, even for the more modest people, whether they were returning to their country or traveling to America in the hope of making their fortune. The Titanic sank within three hours of hitting the iceberg and only a few survivors lived to tell the tale of the tragedy. The exhibition's centerpiece is a clock showing 11.30, exactly an hour before the fateful collision. A few years later and the well-to-do were getting airborne. The Airworld exhibition at Amsterdam's Stedegic Museum, organized by Germany's Vitra Design Museum, shows the development in design and architecture of passenger airplanes dating back to the early days, when flying was an extravagant and luxurious adventure. Some of the early passenger airplanes looked more like the cruise ships they were destined to replace. With nine decks, a gym and a concert stage for 451 passengers served by a 155-member crew, the airliner number four was just one of the big ideas for air travel from the 1920s. It never flew. Next to big ideas, designing for the aerospace industry always had to focus on the details, giving tough limits on space and weight as the exhibition shows. Planes in the 1920s used lightweight wicker chairs and manufacturers quickly adopted aluminium and plastic, the space-age material of the late 40s. Flight attendant uniforms have also changed substantially. Yeah, that's right. In the beginning, uh, in, in the 1930s, when the first stewardesses came, they more or less looked like nurses because they had to reassure uh, the passengers that everything was okay and there was no problem even when they felt a little sick. In the, in the 30s till about the, the 50s, you could really sleep in a real bed, you know, in, in an airplane. And it was a bit like, uh, um, like the train, uh, like the, the train compartments, so with the fold-down beds coming from the ceiling, and it's really interesting to see how the, they changed uh, the, the, the seats to beds in such airplanes. But and we, we mustn't forget that uh, it it took very long that in that uh, time, you know, several days, and of course there were stops in between. But even one. Um, part of the journey was very long. So when we complain now, when we are 16 hours in the airplane, think of that time, it's now much quicker. Advertising posters of the time depict the comfort of flying and also focus on how the world appears to shrink the higher you fly. It's the world's most expensive cigar. 440 US dollars each, and it only comes in boxes of 40. But is it the best? Nobody knows because no one has smoked one. The Cuban Havanas from the Cahiba brand are so precious that no one has actually lit one yet, although the blend was tested before the cigar went into handmade production. According to Norma Fernandez, the torcedora or cigar roller for the El Laguito factory in Havana. The cigar was launched in Spain by Altardis, the exclusive importer of Cuban cigars into Spain. When they say handmade, they mean it. In this case, there were only two hands involved and they both belonged to Norma. She rolled all 4,000 cigars in the limited edition. It's such an exclusive cigar that it is only now starting to be distributed. And because of its high price, just a few people will have the opportunity to get access to it. Norma also had the honor of deciding on the tobacco blend to be used which was designed to honor 40 years of the Cohiba brand. Keeping the production line of Cohiba as the Bejica is another Cohiba. I wanted to give it a little bit of tone, aroma and strength. And that's what I did, but I'm not going to reveal the formula. 
to prevent any leaks. Norma has been doing the job for 39 years and admits to smoking cigarettes and the odd Cohiba Panatella. She was selected from the senior rollers for this special task. The Cohiba Bahika, named after a tribal chief of Cuba's indigenous Taino tribe, can only be bought in special humidors. 18,860 US dollars for the 40 cigars may seem a lot of money, but maybe not for someone who can appreciate this delicate blend of the world's most selected tobacco leaves. Next time on Desire, we celebrate a festival of orchids. We dive into the four seas of priceless diamonds. We scour the fair for the pick of luxury gifts and step into the hotel of the future. But they are actually catered for in other galleries and we feel it's good to give these young people a break. Within the store, there's a whole range of items ranging in taste and style. Jewelry with a modern